Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Sparks, president of the Cooper Union, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to This is What Democracy Looked Like, another important event in our fall season of Cooper Union Great Hall public programming. For those of you who don't know us, the Cooper Union is a small but mighty college in New York City's East Village, a college that is among the very best in the nation for students pursuing degrees in art, architecture, and engineering for students who importantly are committed to questioning the status quo and to pushing boundaries in search of a better world. Since the very beginning more than 160 years ago, Cooper Union's Great Hall has been central to our mission as a free center of learning and as a place for impassioned civic discourse that inspires inventive, creative and influential voices to address the most pressing issues of our day. Under normal circumstances, we'd all be seated together in our historic Great Hall, but for obvious reasons, we can't do that right now. No matter, our important public programming goes on online. Now about our esteemed panel of guests this afternoon. To quote Alicia Chang, who I also really want to thank for being an important driver of this conversation today. Quote, ballots are the most direct tool of participatory democracy. From absentee votes to protest write-ins, ballots are a direct way for us to express ourselves as citizens. Alicia explored this concept in her book, This is What Democracy Looked Like, the first illustrated history of printed ballot design, and she curated the exhibition of the same name that is now on view through November 7th in our colonnade at the Cooper Union. So please take a walk on by the building and take a look at the exhibition. Alicia is the founding partner of Management Design and the Cooper Union School of Arts Fall 2019 Frank Stanton Chair in Graphic Design. She's worked as a senior designer for Method New York and was the co-design director at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. Our moderator today, Samantha B, has quickly established herself as having one of the most unique and sharp comedic voices on television with her late night show, Full Frontal with Samantha B. The show is now in its fifth season and has received multiple awards and nominations, including 21 Emmy nominations and the Television Academy Honor Award in 2018. Most recently, Samantha and her Full Frontal team launched the successful hashtag Mailed It tweetathon campaign that purchased over 130,000 stamps to help save the United States Postal Service. Samantha, welcome back to Cooper. I believe you were in the Great Hall a few years ago as part of Penn America's program. I'm also real, really happy to be welcoming back Zephyr Teachout to the Cooper Union. Zephyr is an author and scholar and has run for political office and is an associate professor at Fordham University School of Law where she teaches and writes about election law, antitrust law, and corruption. Her research has been cited by state and federal courts as well as the Supreme Court. Zephyr actually appeared in the Great Hall in 2015 as our John J. Islin Memorial Lecturer and was again on our Great Hall stage for a primary debate in 2018 as a Democratic candidate for New York Attorney General. Also joining us is Victoria Bassetti, who is a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice at the New York University School of Law and author of Electoral Dysfunction, the companion book to a PBS documentary by the same name. Her writings have been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, Politico, and more. She worked on Capitol Hill for almost a decade and served on the team that drafted the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund, the Patriot Act, the Economic Espionage Act, and the Homeland Security Act. She was also a member of the select team of lawyers that oversaw the Senate impeachment trial of President Bill Clinton. Welcome all. We are so thrilled that you're here. Samantha, I turn the program over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I just want to say that I am a friend. I've known Alicia for a really long time. I think the book is fantastic. 
And uh, so thank you for inviting me to do this. Uh, it was my absolute pleasure. The book is so great. I know nothing. As, as I read your book, I realized that I know literally nothing about the printed ballot. And in some ways just assumed that they always existed in the exact form that we see them today. <laughs> so yeah. I appreciate this opportunity and I'm really kind of facing into this discussion with the spirit of joyful curiosity because I just need to be taught. Um, I woke up this morning and in the Times, there's a huge digital spread about related to the printing of paper ballots. Yes. We are now, we're seeing the most absentee ballots ever printed in American history. So really there is no better time than today to talk about the evolution of the printed ballot, which really is the story of the evolution of this janky democracy. <laughs> Well chosen adjective there, Sam. Thank you so much. It's very professional. <laughs> I will say that it was, it's very edifying to me to know that casting a ballot has always been extremely challenging. If there is some cold comfort in that, I too found that. And just sort of as a note, I too started this whole thing thinking that ballots, I mean, and knowing that, that they had some kind of history, but that they hmm. were normally what was a boring sort of bureaucratic white piece of paper that was just sort of generally ugly. But I'm going to start sharing my screen yeah. to show you some examples of some of the things that I found where, well, um, you know, I knew that what ballots generally looked like, but there's also some amazing examples that I found a ballot that looked like this from 1864, um, this one from 1878, which is like this beautiful multicolored thing, this curvy guy from 1865, and this one, which is 1870. So not to get too into the technical details of how printing worked back then, but it does inform how these things were made. You know, letterpress printing is, doesn't look like this. This is sort of a very tortured version of it, but also something that made my um, own curiosity as a graphic designer, and not really a historian, but I certainly learned a lot along the way, but it started just galvanizing sort of further looking at different ballots as objects. Um, so just as an example, when they used to vote in the very early days, you know, it used to be not on paper. It was like raise your hands or use corn or beans, or it was a smaller scale. So imagine like going down to the village, like, um, you know, schoolhouse or even the tavern and like, you know, they would recognize you. So that was sort of like voter ID right then. It was much simpler times back then. Um, but you know, scale started getting too big and a little unmanageable. So they moved to paper. So this is an example from 1827 where you print the office and you can handwrite it, um, your choice of um, candidate there, or you were given like a bunch of smaller pre-printed ballots like these that were printed um, offices on the back and then the candidates on the front. Um, and then, you know, you start realizing that the inclusion of emblems and representations for parties was kind of like not a set thing back then. So when you start seeing them, they're not just sort of like, you know, elephant and the donkey. It's like crazy chickens and ships and eyeballs and, uh, you know, weird Dr. Seuss trees in the middle. Um, but that also, I realized, was a way for voters who were less literate to sort of recognize and be persuaded to vote in a certain way. So in that way, I think they become much more um, powerful in terms of um, what the ballot composition would include. Wow. Oh, look at that. I know. These are pretty fun. Yeah. What did the, did the color signify anything? Not necessarily, um, but the fact that they were in color is kind of rad in terms of, uh, you know, the idea of having like a colorful yellow thing that you carry around. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these, you know, when you first see them are like, why do they look like that? And, you know, you don't have the explicit answer, but back then parties printed their own ticket. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of in their own best interest to have something recognizable because the voter would take their ticket and put it in the box, but they would know that by recognizing the yellow piece of paper that their vote was, uh, you know, cast in the proper way. Okay, but what if you didn't want to like vote for Jebediah Cowpox from the Angry Chicken Party or whatever? How did you actually, like, how would you, would you physically have to cross out names? How did it physically work? Yeah, you had to, add, like here we sort of take for granted that we can vote kind of split party if you wanted somebody from like working families and Republican, if that is possible. <laughs> But you could do it easily. Back then, no choice. You had a straight party ticket. And that's another thing that I think is hard for people to fathom that, you know, you, you cho chose your party. But within that list, that ticket and candidate list, that was all you had. So the tickets also, the back sides were almost as awesome as the front because they had, 
you know, a lot of color, like very fine engraving. So just to say every part of it was really um, covered right. and stuff. So this is a good example of somebody who's really trying to express their vote. Um, so this one is from 1868. Uh, you know, during Reconstruction, the guy is saying, like, instead of four constitution against, and like every single candidate is a swipe through. Mm -hmm. So that's how you did it, you know, whether or not it was nullified because you wrote on it um, was probably an issue. But this is why, you know, the idea of free choice and your ballot is something that wasn't baked in from the beginning. So is this like the original write in candidate person? Maybe. I wonder if it's, you know, that could speak to this too, if it's sort of like a segue into why we have that little area for write in ballots, you know, just sort of an area for our free expression. Was this the precursor to that? Is that, is that actually why we have that? Uh, I don't know if I could say that for sure, speculatively. Okay. Vic, I don't know if you could speak to that, if that's a concrete example. Well, no, we, we continue to have the, the opportunity for a write-in because um, we, we, we want to basically empower voters to express their will and not to be kind of completely guided by whatever the uh, kind of government bureaucracy says and the names that should be on the, on the ballot. And that is definitely a, a kind of a hangover from the way voters express themselves in the 19th century that you see in the ballots that Alicia just showed you. It's definitely a, a kind of... A, the, the grandson or the granddaughter of that of that ballot Alicia showed you. Can you describe what is happening with this ballot that we're looking at right now? These it's little... not a ballot. It's oh, really sorry. this, when I first saw it, I was like, what are these little tiny slips of paper? Yeah. They're like much smaller than a fortune cookie and you know, tiny names repeated. So these had little sort of sticky backs, like a gummed adhesive on the back. And I learned that they were called pasters. And then I was seeing other um, ballots like this, which were totally like manhandled and worked over. And as Vic was saying, you know, the effort to really cast your ballot in the way you wanted to cast it, with choices you want to make, required actual physical manipulation. So, you know, here you see people's names like cut out, you've got those pacer things stuck on. It's really like manhandled, quite literally. Um, but then <clears throat> when you take a look at the, how the pacers work, and then I was seeing ballots like this, so pretty standard issue, straightforward typesetting. And then the bottom is like all wacko. Like why does it need to be um, typeset in this way that's kind of tortured and bizarre? And then you kind of realize that if you put type on a curve, which is not that easy, but getting easier with different printing processes, putting a sort of like a straight little sticky thing on top of it gets harder and more challenging. So, you know, things get more, um, dense and sort of typographically um, elaborate and partially because it's sort of ornamentation of the period, but partially maybe a sort of like a typographic countermeasure. And I like using military terms and typographic terms together because that's unusual. So at every yeah. stage of this evolving democracy, there have been people trying to keep other people out of the voting process. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, it looks nice along the way and it was attractive, but so you're sort of sniffing through and be like, well, why is this, what's the point of this? Is it just sort of extraneous decoration or is there something else that, you know, could be embedded within it? I mean, I think that we all remember the butterfly ballots. Can you talk a little bit about the political consequences of the structure of a ballot? The structure of a ballot insofar as like the, the list of the names type of thing or how it's, I mean, that's, I guess, what you're talking about now, but are there um, other examples of that? that like, There are plenty, and I think if we get, we can start looking at the way the ballots are laid out, but the other thing to remember is, you know, not only did you not have any choices, per se, within your party ticket, within the party selection itself, it's worth noting that I'm including this, too, it's like a crazy um, diagram showing the rise and fall of different political parties from 1789 to like 1860. So it's like political spaghetti at the end, but it just shows, you know, we were kind of intoxicated with democracy. It was like everybody who needed a different platform could find an ideology that potentially fit. And all those people could also print their ballot and get candidates on their ticket. So just imagine the sort of proliferation of the number of parties, the number of elections, the number of candidates out there. So we have election fever now, but back then it was super bonkers. Like, you know, regular cactus ticket, the Argonaut ticket, United anti-boss ticket. There was a lot of room for ideological flexibility back then. As I was reading the book, I learned about so many different types of ballots. Actually, the one that spoke to me the most was the tapeworm ballot. <laughs> People love that one. I don't know why. Maybe it's because it's so gross. It's the funniest one for sure. Can you describe what that is? 
<laughs> it is a ballot that, as far as I could see, was uh, sounded slightly bigger than a um, like fortune cookie slip. And it was in California and um, Viejo. And apparently they fit like 26 names in like tiny point type and submitted that as legitimate ballot. And the hilarity about it is not just that they did it once, but they tried it twice. And then the California legislation is like, you know what, this is ridiculous. We need some uh, standards here. So that's a good segue into how the ballot format changed and was more regulated. But mm -hmm. these showed just sort of like a whole array of different parties, um, which also leads to ballots that have talked about format question you had before. Here's a ballot that has, you know, some of the party principles printed directly on it. And these happen to be, you know, just very shocking illustrations of the time of very anti-Chinese, anti-immigrant labor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have your awesome eagle saying exclusion of Chinese, protection of free labor. So it's, it wasn't um, too outre to like actually print that as part of your slogan. What were the elections themselves like? Because they seem like they were just bananas. Bananas is a good word for it. They were like much more lively though. It was like a total public spectacle. You know, there was no Samantha Bee show to watch on TV or anything of that. So that was the, that was the entertainment of the day. So just imagine a whole sort of constant carnival. There was like, you know, cannon fire and parades and bull roasts and all sorts of descriptions. Um, but it was also tended to be kind of really violent. And in a way, sometimes that was deliberate to sort of deter you know, more faint-hearted voters from the polls. So it was a much more raucous, uh, but also kind of a potentially violent atmosphere. Okay, what changed? I guess what, how did the ballot evolve into, what is the, as it started to evolve towards something that we could sort of generally recognize? Sort of conceptualize. Yes. Um, so with all that sort of pitch of, you know, the election days being like more violent, a sort of massive proliferation of, the number of ballot formats, et cetera, the epic amounts of fraud. I mean, not to paint too broad a picture, but you know, you have gangs in New York kind of uh, boss tweed type of levels of like mass naturalization and that kind of thing. So, you know, calls for reform. And so surprisingly, we were saved by Australia um, where they are, I know, right? <laughs> That's never been said before. <laughs> I'll say it now, we owe them a debt, actually Tasmania to be more specific. Um, but they were playing with a new format um, in, around sort of late uh, 1850s or so, where, you know, it had aspects that for us were really normal now. So something that the government produced that's regulated, like that was kind of a mind blowing thing. The fact that all the candidates would be on one piece of paper versus many different ones by party. And then the fact that it would be cast in secret as a private act and not such a public one. These are key things that this new format would um, support it. And at the time it was kind of radical and also not a big hit. People were like, you're a coward if you hide your ballot. This is also too complicated for the average voter, which I wouldn't disagree, it's like a lot more time. So, you know, requires a high level of literacy. And there's a lot of other things that even though it's more egalitarian, you start to realize it opens up other ways for voter suppression or ways to sort of favor different um, you know, factions. It's a good place for us to talk about electoral fusion in the two-party system. Sefer, would you mind popping in to talk to us about that? What is, what, what is that? Great. And first of all, I just, you've got to get the book or go by Cooper Union. It is so inspiring and moving to see all these ballots and the names that we're fighting so hard. So um, one of the things, just to step back to this moment that Alicia is talking about, one of the purposes of the colorful ballots is um, if you bribe somebody to vote a certain way, it's very helpful to be able to know whether they vote that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the sort of uh, proliferate, the proliferation of corruption you would see is that really fancy people in town, people that everybody looked up to, would be bribed for more money. So like Samantha, you might have like a $500 uh, bribe because once we see you walking in with that yellow slip of paper and everybody sees it, mm -hmm. first of all, everybody's gonna be like, I guess we're going yellow. We're, that's, the, that's the ballot we'll bring in. And second of all, the people who bribed you know that you are following through on your promise. So one of the key things that the Australian secret ballot does is you might still get $500, but they won't have any way of knowing 
that you actually cast your ballot for that, uh, for the, uh, the dancing chicken party, okay? So you see the sort of anti-corruption moment, but it totally changes politics because all of these proliferations of parties, we now have a vision of what parties are. It was basically like, you know, the, your, your local uh, political club, the Four Freedoms Club in Manhattan can print up its own ballot and pass it out. Um, there's no sort of state, state sanction of parties or who gets on the ballot. The state has nothing to say about who gets on the ballot. The state just says, okay, bring in your names. Once you have a secret Australian ballot, suddenly all the fight is around who is on that ballot. And so um, to get to your question about fusion voting, mm -hmm. um, uh, up through the 19th century to the early 20th century, most states would say, hey, you can vote for uh, you know, Victoria on the uh, Democratic unity ballot and vote for Victoria on the uh, Tea Party ballot and vote for Victoria on the Working Families Party ballot, say. So you could attach Victoria for governor to three different parties. One of the innovations that came along, very much driven by the two major parties, the Republican and Democratic Party, is we don't want people knowing that Victoria is getting more votes from, say, the Working Families Party than from the Democratic Party. So she's going to have to choose. Is she one or the other? And our state law will not allow her to show up with her name next to both parties. So we had this mass wave of banning fusion voting, which is sort of banning the, the right to vote for a candidate on different, the same candidate on different party um, lines. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're all voting for Victoria. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My takeaway is... Yeah. I, I bring the unique Tea Party Democrat Working Family yeah. Coalition together. You talk about future. Yeah. <laughs> How you bring all of us together. <laughs> and, and just to, this is actually a very live question right now in New York. I know there's a lot of people from all over the country, but uh, in New York, a new law passed about ballot access last year. So the question of like, who gets on the ballot and what names can get on is a very live question. And basically it made it harder for um, smaller parties to get on the ballot, saying you need 130,000 votes um, to get on the ballot, um, not just 50,000. Mm -hmm. So right now you might see if you're in New York, I'm definitely a big booster of this, people saying vote for Biden, but as a working families party candidate, because it then shows the power of that other party. So we in New York still have multiple parties. In many states, there's a ban. This one also just shows the kind of goofier, weirder way that graphically you can represent um, how William Strong has like, you know, the hold on whatever five different, um, you know, deck of playing cards parties there too. Um, and things got really absurd with this ballot from 1912. It's 14 feet long. It has <laughs> 600 names organized by different state and district committees. Um, but this was at the New York Public Library and it was just like a massive like what moment because, you know, how would even somebody mark it? I, it's just sort of boggles the mind. But it really was sort of like this extreme format of like, you know, I think they were saying, yeah, okay, these are specifications. We have to have all the names on one ballot. Here's your ballot kind of thing. So right. I think it was sort of this absurd oh, thing that yeah, just absurd, like a, an absurd overreach. Like, here's your fine. You wanted this. Here you exactly. go. You right. have to carry it on your back. Right. And like, have like a massive table and you're just, it's just, it's just crazy to even conceive of it, but it's hard to know. Maybe it was uh, just produced for that purpose, just as a gesture. Don't know. History is weird that way. You don't really know. <laughs> and I, I, I just think this, one of the things this does is complicate our thinking about the secret ballot and the value of the secret ballot that on the one hand, as an anti-corruption person, and I'm sort of assuming most of you are, it's great to sort of, no, not you, okay. <laughs> it's great to sort of, it, it was a really essential anti-corruption regime. But on the other hand, one of the real powers of um, the ballot being privately printed and people being able to take it in themselves is it meant that if you were not literate, 
uh, you would have time to like have real conversations. You wouldn't be facing a wall of hundreds of names that you certainly were not about to look up on the internet at the time. Mm -hmm. And so there's a really interesting moment that's happening right now too, as we see the pandemic leading to more and more mail-in ballots, where you're actually relocating voting in the home mm -hmm. where it was through the 19th century. And then, you know, you still pass in the ballot, but the decision-making moments, the sort of moment of, well, I don't know who that judicial candidate is, mm -hmm. um, is now increasingly happening at home. And I think um, this is going to be a watershed year for changing how people vote. Um, we could talk about this one also um, as an example of two states of our democratic functionality. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> so the left one's from 1944, and the one on the right is from what year, Vic? 18? 1876. 76. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, the, the one on the left is a 1944 federal war ballot and uh, talking about absentee ballots. So the, the kind of the first set of absentee ballots were created during the Civil War when there was a kind of a huge effort to get um, soldiers uh, fighting in the war to be able to vote. And so essentially every time America deployed large numbers of personnel overseas, there was usually kind of a, a real premium on our democracy and showing how much we valued our democracy. So we made superhuman efforts to print up ballots and send it overseas. And in 1944, that's what that ballot did. More than, I think some almost 4 million uh, American personnel uh, sent their ballots back. We were just like, you know, think about it, in World War II, we were spread, Americans were all over the globe. And it might have been, on the one hand, a priority to get them food or ammunition or materiel, but in 1944, we also made it a priority to show off our democracy and have our ballots in the hands of every person overseas. And that ballot in 1876 tells a, a kind of a different story. And that's a story from when America's democracy was probably at, at its, in many ways after the Civil War, at its greatest risk. It was a year where there was an enormous amount of violence at the polls and where as a result of that violence in three states, Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina, not, none of the states managed to send in their ticket of electors. So in in both in all three of those states, they actually actually sent in rival tickets of electors. And the selection of the president of the United States was tossed to the House of Representatives, which created a committee to try to figure out who was going to be president, which kept meeting all the way into March of that year. And at the end of the day, they cut this kind of back deal, this backroom deal, where they swore in Rutherford B. Hayes to be president. And Tilden, who arguably might have actually won the popular vote, was shunted off to the side. Um, and so to me, that ticket is sort of an example of how, you know, our democracy and these pieces of paper hold so much in them. They hold, you know, in many ways, the fate of the presidency and our democracy. Well, what would be your hope for ballots moving forward? What would be your hope, I guess, for the process moving forward? When you look at today's yeah. ballots, you, Alicia, do you just go, oh, <laughs> no, I just, I'm going to stop sharing so we can all just gaze at each other. I mean, they do look like SAT tests nowadays. They look like really boring SAT tests and all of the kind of the excitement and the energy and creativity that you see in those 19th century ballots are, are gone and they're kind of boring bureaucratic ballots and they still, and you know, we, now we have the, the butter, we have a butterfly ballot that can mess something up. You know, just last election in 2018 in Florida, the design of a ballot once again in Palm Beach um, managed, it was so poorly designed that it probably altered the outcome of the Senate race there. Um, to me, so, also, this discussion about the design of the ballot, you know, it's not about it looking prettier, per se, or stylistically more appealing. Um, it's all about sort of the functionality of it. We've been talking so much about how it's a tool, and, you know, examples of this tool have been so decorative and also kind of devious in the way that they're so colorful and attractive. But the fact that the ballots today are boring, I think is like such a triumph. <laughs> like, yay for boring. It took a hundred years to get this boring. And certainly dysfunction of them is a clear 
issue. And so I would say design improvements that help the functionality, the casting of them, the marking of them, the reading of them for sure should happen. But, you know, making them more fun is it's sort of not the point. We don't want to open that Pandora's box of funness or, you know, bad flair. Like, it's okay to be boring if it works. But what we're saying is that sometimes it doesn't work. So. Well, I think there's like, there's three different dreams out there. One is about um, the, the creativity and joy, which we already see in this incredible flowering of a political energy. There's plenty of room for that. It doesn't have to be on the ballot. And it's very exciting to see people dancing in line to vote, you know, when it's extremely difficult and, and that kind of joy and creativity. Um, the, uh, the, the question that I raised earlier, though, is people are really unhappy with the, the straight jacket of the two-party system. So I think it's important to allow for fusion voting, because right now, if you allow a third party to exist, but you can't um, vote for the same person on that ticket, it ends up just being self-defeating. So actually having access to the polls, fusion access, so we can show, like, actually, the Democratic Party is changing because we're seeing more and more people who are voting for that, for Biden, for instance, as a Working Families Party candidate, or the Republican Party is changing because you see increasing number of anti-Trumpers voting. That that's important. A lot of the fight right now, and it is a it is a very high stakes fight, is about other limitations to get to the polls. So if, in as much as the the dark side of the Australian ballot was. Um, an effort to make it hard for people who are illiterate to vote. And then also very explicitly, let's be clear, there was an effort to suppress um, black political power. And so it came along with violence at the polls was an effort to sort of uh, keep, keep people away from the polls. Um, and right now the techniques that are used um, to suppress the vote are techniques of making it difficult to get to the polls in this election, it's about what votes get counted. So it's very much about the physical ballot. It's about does this physical ballot, um, if it gets into the post office but shows up three days late, is that counted? Uh, but it also speaks to that sort of broader definition, I think, of design of the whole ballot process, right? It's not about how this piece of paper looks. It's about how you can register to vote successfully, how you can use that registration to prove your identity at the, you know, so all those points in our process is part of the broader design of the ballot and balloting. So, you know, it's, it's a revelation and going back to the celebration of the boring, you know, oftentimes you have these sort of county clerks who have enough to deal with, much less being asked to be like the art directors or the designer of these things. And, you know, you have a million different specs that you never had before. So in that way, I do think designers as a graphic designer, they could be more involved in that process to help improve it just from like a usability standpoint. Who's going to count all those ballots that they I will. I'll help. I'll help. <laughs> I can't take it. But yeah, I, it's, you realize that the scale that we're operating in is amazing. And I mean, I'm not going to rest on those laurels, but like, I don't know if there's other historic precedents, but just sort of the scale that we're operating in, having learned about what it was like when, you know, you take your donkey down to the center of town and it was a lot easier. But so in a way that task is in and of itself such an epic achievement, but I won't say that we should, we don't have a lot more to work on. But when you talk, I love your description of design as the whole thing. So one of the things that is one of the sort of questions that is part of the design is, um, who, what level of discretion do people have in deciding whether a vote is valid? Mm -hmm. Who runs the BOE, uh, the, the Board of Elections? Um, what kind of accountability does the Board of Elections have? And mm -hmm. we have a pretty uh, disastrous history here in New York City. So the design is everything. And I'd say one of the root things that I dream about, and many people do, is um, is passing a constitutional amendment explicitly giving us the right to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, people talk about the right to vote, but you actually can't uncover the right to vote in the Constitution, which means that even though courts talk about the right to vote, they also talk about the fact that it isn't in the Constitution and are likely to see hurdles to the right to vote as like maybe we're gonna allow that hurdle to go through. They don't treat it as fundamental mm -hmm. in the way that they would if we passed 
um, a constitutional amendment to that end. So just for one example, a sort of contemporary example, is there, there's a lot of talk on uh, the right wing about voter fraud. And voter fraud is basically, uh, and Victoria can speak to this, it just doesn't happen. You know, the, 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 um, but it's used as an excuse to make it much more difficult to vote. If we had a right to vote enshrined in the Constitution, that's the design element I want. If we had that right in the Constitution, states couldn't just say, oh, we're making it really hard because of uh, voter fraud, because they wouldn't actually be able to justify the, the incredible um, hurdles to getting to the polls. Well, Sam, a lot of your work on the show is trying to shine some light on these things, too. I mean, we're all realizing that there's a lot deeper machinations happening. <laughs> Of course. It just is a great reminder to what I said at the beginning is that voting is so ugly. <laughs> like it's beautiful. Yes. And hideous <laughs> at the same time. Victoria, did you want to speak about the, the specter of voting fraud? Well, yeah. So, I, you know, it's really interesting what Zephyr was just saying uh, uh, about the kind of the, the proof of voter fraud. You know, literally in this election, there are going to be, you know, possibly as many as 100 million votes cast. And the, every year there's always like one or two little individual examples of, you know, maybe a uh, like a, a, a mother who signed her child's absentee ballot for them or, uh, you know, some kind of like these small incidents of, of, you know, quote unquote voter fraud. But when you, when you take a look at the whole scope of our elections, the incidents of voter fraud are just absolutely so small as to be just inconsequential. And yet we kind of attempt to completely rework our entire election system around this one colorful incident of fraud, as the case might be. And I was, it's really interesting because uh, when the Supreme Court ruled on voter ID issues, they were talking a lot about whether or not there was voter fraud. And they, the Supreme Court explicitly says, we can't find a single incident of voter fraud of this sort occurring, in this case, it was in Indiana. But there was voter fraud in the 1890s. And then they, they point back to all of these sort of ballots that Alicia was showing, right? These kind of, you know, um, uh, Tammany Hall style boss tweed examples of, of fraud. And, and it's amazing to me how much these sort of, the, the weight of history um, and the weight of the history of ballot kind of continues today. Um, and somehow or another, we can't, we can't, um, we can't cast it off. <laughs> No, we can't shake it. We yeah. Cannot, and I think we'll be hearing so much more about that in the next couple of weeks and then uh, the two months following whatever happens. <laughs> Plus or minus. <laughs> November 3rd. Yeah. I mean, it does call to mind like people already seeding the idea that there is a box of ballots in a river somewhere. Which river? We don't know. I don't want to say. Street, there's streams. It's in streams. <laughs> sitting there waiting. Okay, I'm going to, uh, we're going to take some questions to the panel, and I'm going to attempt to understand the technology of Zoom. I'm going to go into the chat, and I'm going to try to find some interesting questions for you all to answer. Is everybody ready? Everybody's saying hi. <laughs> okay, where am I? Okay, here we go. It's just a lot of love for all of you. I'll scroll through all the love, but I assure you it's there. Okay, here's a question from Bonnie. Is ranked choice voting more democratic in a way to curtail the power of the two-party system? That's a good question. I think Zephyr should answer that question. <laughs> but I mean, I'm willing to give it a, I'm willing to give it a shot. You go first and then I'll say what I think. Okay, so for, not everyone knows off the top of their head what ranked choice voting is. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of give a quick explanation for it. So basically the idea is that right now when you go vote, you, it's a binary choice. You're like either for candidate A, B, or C. But what if in ranked choice voting instead, you could sort of say, I'm gonna vote for, I'm gonna give candidate A my first choice. I'm going to say candidate C was my second choice, and I'm going to say candidate B was my third choice. I kind of make it, made it confusing. But basically, you get to rank each of the candidates based upon your preferences. And then what happens is, if no single candidate 
gets the most number one voices uh, votes you go into a system where you kind of basically rank everyone and ultimately the person who had the the highest number of ones and twos wins the election i think that's kind of a, a way to describe it and what arguably that does is it gets rid of a situation where um essentially someone with only 31 percent or with a like a very small but intensely powerful group of supporters uh, manages to get a plurality of the vote um, and and wins and um, and so what it does is it allows a kind of a fuller expression of all of the diverse opinions of people as they vote using ranked choice voting um, I don't know if it's more democratic but I think it is definitely a way for a better expression of the kind of collective will of the people in a particular political entity. Um, and it definitely would, you know, kind of possibly allow more people to run in different, you know, in from different um, from from different uh, parties. I don't know, Zephyr, what do you think? It's really complicated. Sorry, it's like we have a little contest every once in a while to try to explain what ranked choice voting yes. is. I don't I don't usually win. I don't usually win that contest. <laughs> So I, there's different, is, you did a great job. <laughs> and you, you did a great job also of explaining the, the particular harm that ranked choice voting is trying to solve. The harm of somebody who is opposed by the majority of uh, voters uh, winning. So I am a supporter of ranked choice voting, but I actually think it's context-based. And so in places like in a a uh, city like New York City, where you have Democratic Party control and you have a lot of different candidates running, for instance, for mayor, um, there's a real value in being able to express second and third choices. And so the winner this year will be somebody who en enjoys a broad base of support as opposed to co coalesces a small base. It won't actually do that much in my view. Uh, there's controversy around this, but I, my view is that it won't do that much to change the existing two-party system unless you have what's called multi-member districts. So, <laughs> so it's now like, we're, going, we're going deep now. We're going really deep. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, multi-member districts are districts where instead of like, let's just use a city for now as opposed to Congress. Let's a city where there's 10 people elected at large as opposed to 10 people who are elected for their geographical district. And then if you have ranked choice voting and the top 10 vote getters are all elected in that multi-member district, then you'd really see Green Party or other sort of variety of party of, of folks show up. So um, uh, I, I, what, I, I wanna go meta for a second before we go too deep, is I think what you are seeing right now, which is very exciting, is that there, I think for generations, there was this kind of sclerotic um, false patriotism around the way that things are. <laughs> like, this is the way they are, and therefore this is the way they should be. And feeling like there wasn't ability to change or move. And the power of the, um, the book that you put together is showing like the radical change we can have and therefore the radical change that we can have in different voting systems. So I think the experimentation in ranked choice voting, especially in cities, um, but also let's try it in some other places, is really, really exciting to give people a sense. I'm not just in charge of my vote, but I can be in charge of the systems under which I vote. Yeah, no, it is an empowerment aspect. Um, someone here, uh, Alexandra is asking if you can explain the Electoral College, and the answer is no. Oh my God, no. That's Alex a good event. Thank you. You cannot. Good question. Good okay, question. so it's, uh, I'm going I'm to give it a try. Okay. Oh so when you vote, when you vote on November third, you are not voting for president. You are voting for electors who will vote for president. And those electors will actually meet and vote on December 14th. They'll each of them in, in all of their states, they'll go. And each so each state has electoral college votes and the electoral college votes are basically think of it as like how many seats in the House of Representatives do you have plus two for your Senate seats, right? So whatever your state is, that's how many electoral college votes you have. In the United States is a grand total of 
538. That's why there's that website is called 538.com because that's how many electors there are in the United States. And so when you, so, so essentially to win the electoral college, you have to win a majority of those 538 votes on December 14th. So election day is not November 3rd, it's December 14th if you really wanna get super technical about it. Um, so uh, as you might guess, when you take a look at the number 538, there's like one immediate possible problem from that, which is there could actually be a tie, right? So now that's only happened once in American history. It only happened in 1800. Um, and if there's a tie, it goes to the House of Representatives. So let's not hope that happens. We're just gonna really hope that doesn't happen. But <laughs> But the thing about it is, is that there's all sorts of ways that you can kind of manipulate and work with the Electoral College. For example, some of the electors who get elect, who, who are the ones who actually vote for president, can decide, uh, no, I'm not going to vote for the guy who actually won the popular vote in my state. And those are known as faithless electors. Now, again, no faithless elector has ever changed the outcome of the election. But that's part of the kind of kookiness that's in the way the Electoral College works. And there are all sorts of other kind of crazy things about the Electoral College. Uh, we could we could talk about it forever. <laughs> and this is why when I hear the words Electoral College, I immediately uh, sweat from all kinds of different parts of my body. I'm drenched, even just talking about it for five seconds. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. A well, fun fact about the Electoral College is that um, when you look at the uh, constitutional debates about the Electoral College, one of the reasons they organized it this way is to prevent against corruption. Because yeah. they said the roads are too difficult to travel from state to state. So it'll be too hard to bribe all the different people who need to be bribed. So we're going to organize it so nobody knows what's going on in all the different states. So they all make their decisions separately. It just goes to show you how something that may have started as an anti-corruption tool ends up being this perversion of the popular will. Well, the, the biggest problem with the Electoral College that everyone is really focused on now is the fact that someone who didn't win the popular vote could potentially win the Electoral College because math. But, um, but, you know, basically it's, it's since, you know, we, we remember 2000, right? 2016, it happened. It, you know, it's not, uh, it's not out of the realm of, of possibility that the way it works, that can happen. Yeah. People don't like that. I'm going to, I'm going to ask a, a, a fun question. I'm going to ask another question. That's fun. We're going to go back in time. Okay. Here's a, it's just a technical question from Miriam Fisher. How long did it take to know who won? How did all that counting happen? How, I mean, that's a great question. I cannot answer it. I'm not the expert, you guys go. <laughs> I happily was a graphic designer doing research and looking at cool looking ballots and not really developing any deep research into the nuances of vote counting. But yeah, I can only imagine the scale. It took some time. So I don't know, Vic, do you know? You know, I don't know off the top of my head, but fun fact, you know, the uh, up until 1930, presidents weren't sworn in until March, right? And so it was really only um, after 1932, I think, that uh, that presidents began getting sworn in in January. So maybe maybe it went all the way to March because they were like, we need to keep counting. They, you know, they used to. It did. It did definitely take a fair amount of time to count count the votes. You know. I love this question. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, uh, I think there's probably a really interesting history about the rise of the networks and the way in which sort of pressure to announce along with uh, technological, I don't mean internet, technological capacity. But so I just uh, want to say, though, that right now we are going to um, have to accept, I will not be the only one telling you this, but have to accept that we will not know the results right away. And that that is not a bad thing. That is a wonderful thing. The impatience about a not knowing on the Bush versus Gore night, which I am very well old enough to remember that terrible night. I think most of that impatience comes from journalists, not from humans who are not saying, I can't make dinner until I know who won, right. but journalists who have this kind of like competitive hunger and we really have to push back against, and I say this very seriously, um, really have to push back against immediacy and actually relish 
that we are going into a new era of voting where we, if, if we use, um, if we really want to maximize the vote and we should be maximizing the vote. I mean, that, there's, there's no good principle for limiting the vote that I've, that I've seen. We're so we have to accept yeah. the time. Yeah, and we're so used to sort of instant gratification that way. And for me, the research and looking at when machines started getting more embraced, you know, there was like the automobile, the telephone. And so they were like, voting machines can help it be, you know, faster, easier to count. The human counters are so, you know, fraud, vulnerable to fraud. But even that ended up with paper. You know, they even that had its own issues of expense and things breaking down and things being inaccurate. So we're constantly, you know, plagued by the fact that it just comes down to like literally some person just sort of counting the votes in that uh, sort of analog way. So certainly there was ways technologically that we could, you know, do like the way we do a BuzzFeed survey, you know, who you want to vote for. But, you know, that has its own inherent um, opportunities for fraud, too. So I know a lot of ideas seem simple, but uh, like we've been discussing all these aspects inherently really complicated to preserve the integrity of the vote that is so critical. Here's a question from Taylor Kinzer. Why don't we have one universal ballot design across all the states? Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. Reduce confusion and help with biases. It would be nice, but I don't think it's, it's technically possible. There are possibly, I think, upwards of 10,000 individual election districts in the United States. All of them have different machines and kind of different ballot sizes. They all have multiple different sorts of races that might be on it. Um, different propositions. Like different propositions. And um, it would be, it would be really nice, but I just think, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's actually feasible. It do well, it goes back to like if I don't disagree, it's a great idea. You have to standardize the whole system, you know, the, the way that the whole thing. So, and that's so. Yes, we should all aim for that. But you know, I think our profound American individualism, you know, is proven out that each district, each you know, municipality, its own set of generalized specifications. After this, you know, you know, generally it's all on white paper, all with black ink. But after that. It's totally dependent. So that's why it's such a challenge. I guess we just have time for one or two more questions. But here's a really good one from San Giovanni Bidwans. Were there any significant changes to the ballot when Black Americans or women started to vote to cater to those new voting blocks? Mm. Cater is not the right word. Cater is not the right word. <laughs> not exactly. So there were significant, constant innovations to destroy back black voting power, mm -hmm. uh, including not registering people because they said the, the uh, election law was, you can register by this date and without this test, so long as your grandfather was registered to vote. You know, really explicit um, uh, barriers to uh, black voters. Justice Holmes, um, in a infamous decision in the early, um, uh, 20th century, I think it was 1901, um, actually took a case involving that where there was a registrar who was not registering black voters and said, you know, we're the Supreme Court. There's nothing we can do. We don't, we don't have a solution to this problem. The, a, a lot of the other innovations involved taking those, you know, colorful ballots that you saw. Now the state prints the ballots, but you'd see um, white nationalist groups <laughs> creating their own private ballots, endorsing somebody in a private endorsement system, and then everybody would get the word out, this is the person to vote for. So they basically tried to reprivatize and whiten um, the primary process. And that was very powerful, especially in states like Texas, which were all democratic. So if you didn't win the democratic primary, you basically were out. So it was, Really, 1965 and the Voting Rights Act was really critical because you just see um, really innovative work to um, keep keep black people from voting. But you know, it starts from the very beginning when you know you have efforts for to help enable say more, more less literate voters with the say the use of the emblems per se, but like rampant voter fraud in terms of oh vote for the chicken even you know even though they had no idea. So there was just like constant manipulation of. Um, different voters who may not be as aware. There's also not just the ballot, but the boxes. You know, it wasn't just like one box. There's stories in South Carolina where there was um, the eight box rule where one box for every office. 
and then they would subsequently like change them every couple hours just to change it up to make sure that people were paying attention. So if you weren't paying attention on that level, you know, it was thrown out. So it was just sort of, it's not like, I wish there was, it was a common question, like one ballot that sort of emblemizes the Jim Crow um, efforts, but the whole thing was always opportunities for engineering for to keep people down and away from the vote. Okay, I'll ask one final question and then I think we're coming to the end of our session. Okay, seems like local ballot questions, yes, no, are so inscrutable. <laughs> Legalese has to discourage understanding of voting on these questions, right? Who decides on the wording and why? Mm. Good question. Ooh. I know generally the wording has been closely examined by places like the Center for Civic Design, which has been doing great work to sort of help create guidelines for election administrators to help, you know, finesse not only the look of the ballot, but also the language within which simple questions are posed. It seems pretty elemental to us now, but it's pretty fundamental how you can kind of muck up a simple question and make it kind of confusing. So those efforts of purely linguistic and visual clarity are being made and hopefully in put in more hands for different uh, state electoral officials. But in terms of how to parse out like your propositions uh, that are local. I don't know who actually manages that, probably Secretary of State's or County Clerk type of level. Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. I really am not sure I know the, the easy answer to it. Yeah. There's no <laughs> easy answer. You see I know, the exactly. it's, <laughs> it's, the, the, it's, you know, it's the Attorney General is, you know, there's a different process that reviews the wording in each state um, and a different process that reviews the wording. We have a totally federalized system. But here's what I hope is that the fact that everyone's asking these questions, like yeah. I wasn't asking these questions, like, you know, whatever. So I'm hoping that because, and I know it's sort of, it's a four year cycle, like every four years you get really hot and bothered over about the ballot. But you know, maybe this, hopefully this the level of engagement and momentum, the lines that I saw this weekend were crazy. Maybe everyone is like to more patient to like look under the hood figure out what it is. Maybe they could help and not have it be just sort of every four year, like, oh my God, like, so. I got to think about this for three <laughs> years. I mean, you know, not that we obsess over it, but it could, you know, peak more people to be engaged on this level, ask these questions and then try to pursue some sort of more satisfaction. Well, you know, if there's only something like 732 days until the midterm, so don't worry. We'll have right. <laughs> plenty of time. Just let that be <laughs> Anyway, I think our time is done. Uh, I've really appreciated hearing from all of you. Thanks, Alicia, for this book. Thanks, Zephyr. Thanks, Victoria. And thanks, everyone who tuned in. And thank you also for the great questions. This was really, I enjoyed this thoroughly. This is a nice way to spend a foggy lunch hour. <laughs> thanks, Sam. Thanks so much. Thanks, thank you all. Thank you.